Bloom, Buddhist Reflections on Serenity and Love by Ajahn Sona. Part 1. Serenity. The breath is a royal road. Ajahn Sona. Chapter 1. As a Child. So we're off to a very good start. You've taken the precepts, arrived at the monastery, and made a great effort to get here as well. The intention just to go on a substantial retreat like this needs to be formulated, sometimes months in advance. And all that effort is not something that is an impediment to it. Actually, it's something which enhances it. To make an effort over a period of time, stay with a determination, and then carry that out is a very good message to oneself. It sounds strange to be talking about messages to oneself, but we do talk to ourselves. We tell ourselves stories, and every time we do, we train ourselves. One of the features of the eight precepts and the five precepts is to abstain from false and harmful speech. What happens psychologically is that if one indulges in false and harmful speech, these become little circuits that feed back on themselves. If one has to misrepresent reality to others, then one ends up misrepresenting reality to oneself. Then, after a while, we become uncertain about what reality is. It no longer becomes a story. We genuinely get lost, and then we can't recover it. This is the nature of the truth. It is very, very important to tell ourselves the truth, to speak at least not falsely to others. Everything we do is a feedback circle, and when we make determinations to overcome distances and time and all the other things that have to be done to go on a retreat, we're telling ourselves some very brave and clear messages. That your inner life is important, that the quality of your life is paramount, and that your life is made within you. It's not an external feature. And you're also committing to the results that come from practice and work on the mind itself. So to make such determinations transforms you. We're always changing, but we have choices about how we will change. If we decide not to do these things, we give up, we feel lethargic, we don't have hope, then that is exactly the reality we will create. And so the beginning of this retreat is not now, but started weeks ago, and for some of you, years ago. Some of you have been to retreats here on several occasions over the years, and those are all still playing themselves out. The results of those retreats are still affecting and changing you. They are being put into this complex structure called the mind. But it's not the mind alone. That's not really the important part. It's the emotional life the emotional quality of our life. And all of the teachings of the Buddha are about that. They're not about ideas. Ideas are only useful if they lead to the end of suffering. And the end of suffering is just one way of putting it. It's the negative way of putting it. Obviously, what remains after the end of suffering is truly profound well-being and happiness. And that is the unabashed goal of the Buddha. What he says about himself is that he dwells unshakably in well-being. He's purified the emotional structure. He also says, I have many thousands of disciples that have done the same thing to one degree or another, some to a profound degree, some to a lesser degree. And I have many thousands of lay disciples who have done this as well, transformed their lives and purified the emotions. So this is a transformation of emotions. You have to understand a little bit about how they work. Those are the ideas in the suttas, the discourses of the Buddha. There are ideas, some fancy ideas like dependent origination, which is causality in the mental-emotional structure. But remember, it's not about sophisticated ideas. It's about powerful techniques for changing your mind. This is a kind of technology for these modern times, when we really don't have any such technology regarding the emotions. We've got all kinds of gadgets now, people playing with biofeedback and such things, 
but they are not as effective as the structures the Buddha offers. One of the differences Buddhism has with modern psychology is that modern psychology's approach is through the intellect and through analyzing the story of one's life. The Buddha is different in the sense that he is questioning the validity of the story itself. He's saying, it's a story, but there isn't a character behind the story. The story is fiction, and the character is fictional as well. Fortunately. Otherwise, there wouldn't be a way out. All you'd be able to do is modify the story. So actually, he's asking you to see through the story of your own life, and even deeper, the story of your own self. The very sense of your own self is a fabrication of various unexamined assumptions. So how do we do this? This retreat is unique in the sense that I'm going to try to stay on the topic of breath meditation the entire retreat. I will bring in other things, but my primary purpose is not to give you a smorgasbord of meditation techniques, but to concentrate primarily on breath meditation. And quote, breath meditation is a very meager description for what's really going on here. There are incredibly profound possibilities. Your life, the value of your life, is in your emotional structures. And we can utilize this breath as a means to put you into an utterly different zone. We learn all these Dhamma ideas, such as, we shouldn't feel guilty, we shouldn't feel remorse, we shouldn't feel sad, we shouldn't feel angry. And then we have an argument with somebody, and it sticks with us for 18 months. We can't get over it. Then it's 10 years, and we still can't get over it. What's going on here? We know perfectly well we shouldn't hang on to these things, but somehow it's impossible to let go. So it's not good enough to try and think your way through. It's not good enough to have a doctrine like this. We need some means to actually shift us out of our normal compartmentalization of things. Where we think and where we live must become one. Occasionally it happens to people that they are brought into some other emotional space by a certain set of circumstances. Powerfully good interactions with people for sustained periods of time, or some sort of musical experience or artistic experience, or a drug of some sort, will put them in a mood where all their troubles have dissolved. It's a powerful experience because you've stepped right out of an emotional area that seems to have been a locked room the locked room of normal thinking processes and the baggage of our stories. How do we get out of that room? You do things. You can. We're going to open the door and get out of that room into a space where the story is not there anymore. It's wonderful. It's all gone. It's all trivial. It doesn't mean anything anymore, and you feel wonderful. How do you get out of that door, you ask? There's a man sitting in the corner, and that's the Buddha. And you say, how do I get out of here? He says, breathe. What? Is he crazy? What kind of answer is that? It's got to be more sophisticated than that. No, it's breath. Breathe. He's been in the same tangle as you. Before he was the Buddha, he was tangled. He was trying to figure his way out of it. And that's where we begin with this beautiful story. There are many accounts of the technique of how to do breath meditation, but I've found the most important part of the story is almost always left out. He takes up the idea of the breath as a child. Now, I remember my own childhood. I'd be lying there, seven years old, eight years old, on my back, especially in the summer. It's still light out, and you're supposed to go to bed, and you have nothing to do. So I'd start to notice that I was breathing. As a child, you do blunder across that. I think everybody must have. Of course, though, I've had a lot of time to remember things. I've been just living the meditative life for 35 years, and often in places where there's nothing else to do. So sometimes you remember your childhood and so forth. I remember all these experiences and how you can become aware of the fact that you're breathing and what a strange thing it is. It just goes by itself. I think it's very important that the preliminary story of the bodhisattva's struggle towards enlightenment 
begins with him leaving the palace, his dismay with ordinary life, even a very good material life. Dismay is a sign of a sophisticated, very sensitive person. The things other people do to spend their time he just doesn't understand. They are too shallow. It's not enough. It just cannot be enough. He's not an ordinary person. For him, it's so unsatisfactory that he has to go in search of something more profound. He's looking for the big vision of life. At some point, it has to become overwhelming to him that life just goes by and you die, and you can lose everything along the way as well. How do you make sense of that? So that's what drives him out. And he falls in with people who are trying to solve the existential problem as well. And they've got some very elaborate techniques. They've got authoritative statements about absolute truth. And he tries all kinds of things in a very, very dedicated way. Some of these techniques are painful, self-destructive, and misleading. Eventually, though, he drags his sorry, skinny body out of there and says, enough of this. This is after six years of very harsh treatment of his body and very harsh treatment of his mind. He's still intelligent and sensitive enough, and basically such a good human, that he has enough insight to say, this can't be the way. I'm looking for something else. I'm not sure how to find it, but this isn't it. That's a very wise decision he makes in the midst of perhaps a very authoritative culture. These guys are telling him, this is the way, you got to stick with this. But he leaves anyway. And I find the setting of the story is very important too. He's decided to eat, and that's very beautiful. These stories become poignant and beautiful. How many times in our lives have we practiced self-deprivation, imposed all kinds of difficulties and relentless demands on ourselves, refused to eat in some ways? What is eating? Eating is a very primal act. The Buddha says, what's the one thing? By the way, if you're teaching Dhamma Sunday school class, this is a great one for kids. This puzzle question, what's the one thing? Eventually kids get it if you give them a few hints. It's food. Every being in the universe has to have food, some form of food. The one thing. It's also your earliest experience with your mother to be fed. And there's a lot of emotion and love around that as well. He's actually returning to love in some ways by stopping this deprivation at the material level, just eating again. And really joining the universe and saying, everybody has to eat, you can't not eat. And he accepts food with gratitude. There's a very beautiful element to the story which depicts Sujata, the first person to spontaneously and generously offer him a meal. It's a very primal act in the story, isn't it? And so moving. We're continuing that story to this day. We're acting this out. The lay people are offering food to the monks, and we're accepting it as well. So this is a very kind and human story that's being told here. The first thing we have to do is stop indulging in pain, you know. It's just not the way. Pain is not the way. We need to sustain our body. That's the function of food. The body comes alive when you've eaten. And then he's got to take care of his mind. It's very beautiful that he's chosen a shady tree by a river, a huge banyan tree beside a river, and you can imagine the breeze coming across the water. It's May this month. On the 20th will be the full moon of May, and that will be the time of year that the Buddha was supposed to have obtained awakening under the Bodhi tree. Formerly, he would stay out in the baking sun, and it would have been hot at that time of year in India. He was trying all kinds of things that were supposed to be spiritually good exercises, but were really just conducive to ruining your health and making you miserable. He'd freeze at night, bake in the day. But now all that is over. So he has taken up residence under a beautiful, spacious, shady tree. In India at the time, there was just no cooler place to be. And the body, I'm sure his body was just celebrating the fact that he'd given it some calories. 
And here arises something spontaneous. He remembers being under a tree as a child, in a beautiful, shady, cool place, surrounded by his aunts and nurses and family. They were very loving and kind, and he'd probably been fed already. This child is wanting for nothing, and he's out in nature with a totally friendly environment around him under the tree. So in a sense, when you do this breath meditation, that should be the story. Everything is very kind and simple, as a child might do it. And it's also a giving up of our painful ways. We do things to ourselves. We have these grim messages. We get impatient with other people. We get impatient with ourselves. Why? Why is the question? It's so easy to do, to slip, to get angry, to be critical about everything, to tell yourself a story that just creates a sense of danger around you, anxious and unpleasant. All these stories are negative, self-punishing types of experiences. The Buddha's story is about giving all that up. It's just foolish. To arrive at the right spirit to begin this practice, you just come to it like you're arriving under the banyan tree, a shady place, quiet, conducive to something positive. And then maybe it will make associations if you had some moments in your childhood when you were happy. Maybe you can remember. He did. He remembered being a child and going into a state of bliss. It's called the first jhana, deep meditation. But it's really just a blissful state, empty of thought. He wasn't thinking. He was just experiencing the exquisite feeling of breath. And the air that was coming in his nose must have been just so cool, noticing the exhalation and inhalation. As a childhood memory, obviously it's not anything yogic. It's not some archaic or esoteric technique. He's a kid. He doesn't know any of that stuff yet. There's no control to it at all. The mind is surrounded by a sense of loving kindness and protection. His defenses can be dropped. Anxieties are gone. He's remembering what it was like to be a child when he could just sit and just feel the breeze against his face and breathe gently. Then the bodhisattva thinks, remember, he isn't the Buddha yet. That was a harmless pleasure. Nothing bad could come of that. He's given up all the sophisticated things he's learned from six hard years of really relentless grind, and he's given up the shallow pointlessness of his previous life in the royal court, which was not painful, but just not enough, shallow. And somehow he's intuited, I guess I had to go through that. Sometimes in life, we feel we had to make some mistakes before we could realize where to go. So in some ways, yes, he had to experience the painful in order to come to this. It's a very simple but profound realization. It's very beautiful. Which is like a lot of scientific discoveries. Scientists talk about them having a quality of beauty to them. Simple, beautiful, elegant. And this is one such in-your-face kind of realization. So that's the beginning of his awakening. You know, the story goes through the night, but the first part of it is just this pure samadhi, pure serenity, pure joy. And then the body is taken into this joy. The body is flooded by a sense of ease. Your body is suddenly not a problem anymore. After starving himself, his body must have been a problem. It must have had sores on the skin and all kinds of things. But at this moment, his body suddenly becomes not a problem. We would call it sukha, a kind of quality of happiness or well-being in the body. It's a side effect of the mind really being well and happy. You see this quality even in boxing matches when the fight has come to an end. The guys have been smashing each other in the face and punching each other in the ribs and every part of their bodies must hurt. It's got to hurt. How could it not hurt? Yet, at the end, the winner acts as if he's just gotten out of a bath or something. He's happy as a clam, jumping up and down. 
Because he's joyful, there is no pain. Tomorrow, there will be pain, yes. But in joy, the body is flooded with a kind of pain reliever. It's gorgeous. Both parts work together, body and mind, and that's how you know you're on the right track. The bodhisattva is getting feedback from nature that he's on the right track. How is he getting that feedback? The feedback is that it's a totally pleasant experience. It's positive, beautiful, and he says there couldn't be anything bad in this. There's nothing harmful about this. There's nothing to fear in this. And this is another word, fearless, to be free of fear. Fear permeates life, and we call the 20th and 21st centuries the age of anxiety. And anxiety is a kind of unfocused fear, a floating, pervasive sense that you're always slightly afraid. And this has to go. It does go. Anxiety does go in these beautiful conditioned states. There's no anxiety there. For many people, that might be the first time that they forget to be anxious. A person who is anxious and clever about being anxious can be in the midst of a party, in the midst of a conversation, can even be enjoying themselves to some degree. But they still have a little voice in the background, a little sense behind them that keeps them out of the experience and keeps them saying, you know, the thing in my stomach is still not gone. I'm kind of having fun here, but I am still an observer of myself. And part of me is left out of this experience, existentially isolated and still anxious. That part has to go. Can you ever not be standing beside yourself? Can you ever not be self-conscious and partly removed from the experience? Can you ever be one again? When you were a child, you were one. Yet, as you got older, you started to develop the second, this other thing that stands outside of the experience. One of the factors in the first jhana is called ekagata, which is often translated as one-pointedness. But it could be just one. I'm not standing outside of the experience anymore. I've decided to completely let go of all anxiety and reservations and plunge in. This phrase, plunge in, is one of the phrases used again and again to describe the experience of enlightenment, plunging into the deathless. The Buddha also uses the simile of elephants bathing. They love water. They play in the water. These huge elephants love to go into the lotus pond and spray water everywhere and eat lotuses and roll and float in ponds. They play, they plunge into these ponds, and they enjoy themselves immensely, bellowing and blowing water everywhere. This is good. I like that. And that's similar to what we're doing with this breath meditation. You're going to plunge into this. You have to plunge in. You cannot be Canadian and merely touch your toe in the freezing cold water. One of the most famous sayings in Canada is, it's not bad once you get in. Our water never really gets warm up here. But as a kid, you keep going into these ice cold lakes and you learn this phrase, it's not bad once you get in. So in meditation, you have to eventually abandon your second thoughts, your self-consciousness, your anxiety, and go in, because it's entirely blameless and nothing to fear. One-pointedness is also wholeheartedness. None of you, none of yourself wants to be doing anything else. You're not partially in it. You're entirely immersed in the experience. Nothing is left out. So much of our life feels like part of us is not there. Part of us would rather be somewhere else. And these days, with all the multitasking, part of you has to be somewhere else. You can never just be here doing this. Some part of you always has some other agenda and a calendar and an appointment or something like that. But you get used to it. You believe after a while that there's no alternative, that this is the way life is. This is called resignation. You resign yourself to this. You give up even any stories of alternatives. But this is just a story. There is an alternative. There is some other way. 
You should not give up on this. And this is where we're going with breath meditation. This is just a means to an end. The breath meditation is a means to an end and to something very, very simple. It's not an idea. It's an experience. You're going into a pond and swimming, maybe floating on your back, staring at the sky, or getting out of that pond and sitting under a tree and feeling very refreshed and relieved and not wanting to be anywhere else in the whole world ever. That's another feature. Time falls away. You stop with the past. You stop with the future. That's also the nature of one-pointedness or wholeheartedness. When you're wholeheartedly engaged in anything, there's no future, no past, and that's the most beautiful experience. Not only is this a good, beautiful experience, but it heals the mind, and it allows you to think like you've never thought before in an entirely new way. You can see things differently, and that's what this insight business is about. You can't really see differently if your mind has not been liberated from its normal confinements, its normal self-consciousness, its anxieties, and so forth. Emotional liberation precedes an intellectual understanding. Emotional release precedes wisdom breakthroughs. And those wisdom breakthroughs don't eliminate the emotional freedom. They deepen it. They strengthen it. They allow you to spend more and more time in it. Ultimately, the goal is to never leave that freedom. And so this is the process we will sweetly and gently and kindly move towards through the whole week. That has to be the theme. There's nothing hard about this. We want to stop doing the hard, painful part of life. It's more about childlike innocence and a return to something beautiful and blameless. I will again and again move us towards this mood of innocence as the overarching picture of meditation throughout the retreat.